Greetings, this is Greg. My EcoBoost Mustang suffered an engine failure in spectacular fashion, so I thought I would share it with you. Now, I want to be clear, I am not bashing Ford for this. The standard Ford 2.3 liter EcoBoost holds up just fine at stock power levels and a bit beyond, but I had my engine putting out a pretty crazy amount of power. The engine was so badly destroyed that it had to be replaced. Rebuilding it was not an option. So I bought a new engine from Ford, and I talked about that new engine in my last video on this subject. That engine is now in the car as seen here, and it's running perfectly. So what went wrong with my original engine? Why did it blow up? It happened because we ran so much pressure in the cylinders that it bent the connecting rods, ultimately leading to one of them failing and utterly destroying the engine. I'd asked people in my previous video to post in the comments section and speculate as to why they thought the engine failed. A huge number of people suspected knock destroying a piston, and rightly so. Knock is usually the reason a modified turbo engine will fail, and it will usually be seen as damage to a piston. However, we had no knock in this engine. It was set up very carefully to avoid that, and there were no signs of knock when we tore it down. No damaged pistons, except of course for the one in which the rod ripped itself out of, and then it was only damaged on the lower half. There was no sign of knock on any of the pistons, no pitting, no collapsed ring lands, nothing like that. The spark plugs were fine as well, and the data from the two knock sensors were in harmony and indicated no knock was occurring. Some others suggested a head gasket failure due to a problem either with the gasket itself or the head bolts stretching, or more commonly, a problem related to Ford's open deck design. Of course, had it been any of those things, I would have fixed, not replaced the engine. Talking about the open deck design, and for those who don't know, that's a block design in which there is no real structure around the cylinders at the top. It's just the strength of the cylinder itself and the way the head bolts up that gives it enough strength to handle the huge combustion chamber pressures that happen near the top of the cylinder. All things being equal, an open deck design is weaker than a closed deck, but offers better cooling. In reality, however, all things are never equal. This is an open deck Alfa Romeo engine. Alfa, Maserati, and Porsche all make frequent use of open deck designs and are all relatively strong. However, the open deck on the Ford 2.3, while at least decent, is not super strong. Ford made a stronger version of the EcoBoost 2.3 called the EcoBeast which was a bolt-in replacement short block for the EcoBoost. Sadly, the EcoBeast is discontinued, but it did use the same open deck block, but with an insert in there to add strength. I really wanted to buy one of those for my car, but again, Ford has discontinued them. Back to the blown engine. The failure had nothing to do with the block design, nor did it blow a head gasket due to stretched head bolts or anything else. The head gasket was actually just fine. The bearings were fine as well. When a connecting rod fails, it's typically from excessively high RPM. Normally, it's when someone with a manual transmission car is trying to downshift and hits second instead of fourth or first instead of third. The RPM will then skyrocket above its limits and the engine's rev limiter cannot save it in that situation. The inertial load of the piston will try to pull the rod apart, typically causing a failure at one of the bearing ends. In my experience, more often than not, this will be at the big end bearing where it connects to the crankshaft. The result is typically a thrown rod. The rod comes off the bearing and is thrown in some direction, sometimes with enough force to punch right through the block and exit the motor. This is not what happened to my engine. My car has an automatic transmission, so I couldn't over rev it via downshifting if I wanted to. The car's software prevents it. My car did not throw a rod in the normal sense. The other type of failure in connecting rods is from compressive stress, the opposite of pulling it apart. It's when the piston and crankshaft are pushing on it with more force than the rod can take. This type of failure is relatively rare, but does happen, and it is what happened to my engine. This results in a bent and eventually a broken connecting rod. A bent rod is typically caused by a hydrolocked engine. The engine's running fine, the air intake gets submerged, a cylinder fills up with water, and then on the compression stroke, well, something has to give because that water is not going to compress much, and what gives is usually the connecting rod. That's exactly what happened to the connecting rod in this picture, which is off of a Spanish-built Seat. It is not a rod from my car. It just happens to be a really good picture of a bent rod, so I used it. 
My engine did not hydro lock and it didn't over rev. The rods just couldn't handle the stress of the extra cylinder pressure we were giving it in an effort to get a lot of power. Let's take a look at the carnage. This is my engine. I have unbolted the crankshaft and pulled the crankshaft out a bit for clarity. You can clearly see a bent connecting rod. Next to it, you can see the more severe damage. The remains of cylinder 2's connecting rod is still on the crankshaft. It was probably bent for some period of time, running at the track all day and at high RPM and high power output, put expanding and compressing forces on these bent rods over and over until after the track day on the way home it finally let go. Obviously one rod has to go first, and in this case it was the rod for cylinder number 2. When the rod broke, chaos ensued. The remaining part of that rod that was attached to the crankshaft flung around like a medieval flail, destroying all within reach. It punched large holes in both sides of the block, the oil pan, and trashed the bottom of number two cylinder. It also destroyed the engine's balancing shaft rig by breaking it free of the block, causing it to drop into the oil pan. That big gear you see there on the crankshaft is used to drive the balancer. These are the remains of the balancing rig. I just want to point out that I think these balance shafts are kind of stupid. I don't notice any real change in smoothness as compared to a well-made, well-balanced four-cylinder, but they take power to drive, they add complexity, weight, and a failure point. On the EcoBoost 2.3 liter engines, it's very common for performance builds to delete this balancing rig entirely. The balancing rig also costs money. I think Ford would have been much better off spending that money on stronger connecting rods and a slightly upgraded block like the EcoBeast or maybe what they use in the 2-liter EcoBoost. In fact, my frustration with Ford here is that the EcoBoost engine, the 2.3, could have been to four-cylinder engines what GM's LS is to V8s. That is, it could have been the go-to motor for four-cylinder hot rodding. Now, I understand it's being built to a price point and there are other factors here. Overall, the 2.3 is a decent engine, but it could have easily been so much more and probably for less money than what they sent on that balance rig. In a nutshell, my engine failed because I just put too much cylinder pressure in there and pushed down on the piston so hard it bent the rods, one of which eventually failed from the forces flexing it at the bend point. The rods are a pretty serious weak link here. They're about equal in strength to the connecting rods in a Fiat 1.4 liter engine, an engine with far less displacement and 150 fewer horsepower. Now on the plus side, the combustion chamber in the Ford 2.3 seems to be a pretty good design in terms of knock resistance. We were able to make all this cylinder pressure and resulting power with no knock, as discussed earlier. I was pleased to find that the rod and main bearings held up just fine. These engines don't have a factory installed oil cooler or an oil temperature sensor. Instead, the engine's computer calculates oil temperature and pulls back power if it thinks it's too high. Still, high oil temps do pose a danger during track events. Ford knows this is an issue, and as people will take their turbo Mustangs to the track, they have to have a fix. That fix is a paragraph in the owner's manual that says if you're taking your car to the track, change to a heavier oil before you go, then change it back for street driving. I did do this. But I have to admit, I don't do it for drag strip runs. By the letter of the law, so to speak, I think you're supposed to. In any case, a lot of folks thought the engine might have failed due to an oiling issue. As with knock, that's a good guess, but it wasn't the case here. Now we get to the prize round. I did offer a prize in the previous video to anyone who guessed and explained the cause of the failure correctly. Details are in the previous video, so I won't go into them again here. The prize being a Mustang EcoBoost intake from my shop, Euro Compulsion, along with a performance filter. In the event that the winner already has an intake for their EcoBoost Mustang, then I'll send an intercooler, or in lieu of that, $200 in store credit from the Euro Compulsion shop. We have a lot of stuff for the Mustang there, exhaust, brake pads, cleaning supplies, etc. So if you win and you have an EcoBoost Mustang, you should be able to find a prize you want. The problem is, and this is where I'm going to need your help, nobody really nailed this. There were, however, a few nearly correct answers, and I do have to have a winner, so let's go over the contenders' responses, and then I'll put up a poll in the community section where you can vote for the winner. Now, you remember in grade school when some teacher would pull that crap on a multiple-choice test saying, choose the answer that's the most correct? 
I always hated that, I, I still do, because in most cases it makes the correct answer a matter of opinion, which is the case here. I selected the commenters who mentioned connecting rod failures, but it's up to you to decide who was the most correct or closest to the mark. Let's look at the contenders. First up we have Joe. This guess is entirely correct, but a condition was that to win, you had to state the cause, not just what broke. Typically a rod will fail from over revving or hydro locking. There is nothing here about the cause. He just said a rod broke. Had he said it broke from too much power, that would have cinched it. Kushma, I think that's how you say that name, is up next. He guessed that the head gasket failed. It didn't, but then failing, causing coolant to get into the cylinder and hydro lock the engine. At least that's how I'm reading this. He did say a rod bent, which is why he's a contender, but he didn't get the cause anywhere near correct. He also asked about the price of the engine, the new replacement engine that is. At the time of this video's creation, on the Ford Performance website, that engine is $5,242.50. Next up, we have Kenham or Ken M. Either way, he mentioned a rod failure, so he's in the running, vote accordingly. Victor, as with all the others, Mention the connecting rod failing. As for this happening because a knock sensor failed, resulting in an overheated piston, no, that's absolutely not what happened. As for Dennis here, Dennis didn't even try to win, but he still gets honorable mention because his comment really should be required reading for anyone working as a mechanic or planning to do so. He is addressing my complaint about the junk plastic connectors under the hood in modern cars. Dennis won't be in the poll, He's not in the running in terms of the contest. I just like his comment. So that's it. Please vote. And if you're the winner, contact me and I'll send this stuff out. If it's the intake and you're in the 48 states, I'll even pay for shipping. As for my car, it's all together. It started up on the first try. The engine change was very straightforward, but there are a couple things I should point out. Neither of the two wiring harnesses that came with the new engine would fit my car. Maybe if my car was a manual, one of them would have but I did have to reuse my original wiring harness. So if you're doing this engine change, don't break any of that plastic crap on the wiring harness. I pulled the engine out with the torque converter attached to the drive plate. Thus, I lost some transmission fluid. I have since learned that fluid for this transmission is almost $20 a quart. I should have removed the starter motor and unbolted the torque converter from the drive plate so it would have stayed in one place or stayed in place when I pulled the engine. Or maybe I shouldn't have. I guess it's a matter of cost of transmission fluid versus time to unbolt that stuff while it's in the car. Speaking of the drive plate, I did have to remove the flywheel that came with the engine and the pilot bearing for the manual transmission's input shaft. Remember, they send you an engine set up for a manual, so I had to switch things around to make it suitable for an automatic. Other than that, pretty straightforward swap, and it went about perfectly. I did install our intake and I upgraded the intercooler to the current design with better ducting. I had the prototype design on there before. The ducting really helps force air through the core. Without it, a certain amount of air spills around the core, making the intercooler a bit less effective. We sell the intercooler with or without it. The ducting does add quite a bit to the cost, but for me it's worth it. I like this intercooler design for three reasons. First, it's big and the EcoBoost 2.3 really benefits from more intercooling. Second, unlike most of the other big core designs on the market, this one doesn't block much of the air conditioning's heat exchanger. That's not a huge deal, but there are days in Oklahoma when I want every bit of air conditioning I can get, so I don't want to sacrifice that for more intercooling. The third big feature of the dual core design is that it puts the largest portion of the intercooler's core below the car's other radiators. In other words, on a typical intercooler installation, you have the air conditioning condenser in the car's radiator, maybe transmission cooler or whatever, right behind the intercooler, which slows down the flow of air through the intercooler itself. These things essentially restrict the intercooler exhaust. In this picture, you can see that's not the case here. The intercooler can exhaust directly into the relatively low pressure area in the engine compartment. By low pressure, I mean relative to the pressure forward of the air conditioning condenser. This layout really helps the cooling air flow through this thing. They're not too expensive either, and quite a few vendors have them, but an advantage of getting it from my shop is that we check every one before it goes out. Over on the Unity Motorsports Garage YouTube channel, Andy put one on David Vizard's EcoBoost Mustang. 
and gained about three miles per hour in the eighth mile, which is a big improvement over the stock unit. In the case of Mr. Vizard's car, he's running our upgraded version with welded on ducting to prevent cooling air from spilling around the core and to force it through. It also has nozzle holders for water sprayers or nitrous purging if you're inclined to use that. Back to my car, initially I'll be running this on the dyno with the stock tune, then I'll add in a turbo that's been ported by David Vizard. Then instead of putting on our tried and true phase one tune, I'll be doing some different mods I think you guys will enjoy seeing. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, goodbye, and have a great day.